Uh, welcome, Senator Kim Pat. Thank you so much for uh, joining our live and having being part of this with us. I'm so excited that uh, we're going to start doing this together and uh, putting out some sort of weekly content to mobilize millennials and Gen Z to stay informed, take up action, and champion change in our country. I'm super pumped to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's fantastic. I, it's young people who are inspiring me to be involved in so many of these issues. And um, I'm wearing a shirt that I just got yesterday at the market. Um, and a friend of mine, Elder Albert Dumont, uh, who's a who's an uh, Algonquin elder from Kitigan Zibi, and I, of course, live and uh, work in the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek. So, and I was on the hill. Uh, Two days ago with uh, Mumalat Kayak and Charlie Angus and Matthew Green, who were uh, drawing attention to the, the fact that uh, the ongoing issues of murdered uh, or missing children and the graves and the genocide of uh, Indigenous people in this country. So you, you guys are leading and thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, so excited to have you here. I think often politics seems a little scary or daunting to engage with. We always comment on our grid that a big part of that is, you know, it really isn't built into our curriculums in a way that like builds that capacity to engage meaningfully. Um, you know, like when I was growing up in Ontario, I did two months of it. It was like a quarter co course. It wasn't even a half course. It was a quarter co course on civics. And I was too young to understand the importance. Um, and it's probably one of the most important things to take away from school and our public education system is how do we meaningfully engage um, in democracy and in in the future of our country. Um, so I'm really I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that today because we have an upcoming federal election, and I really mm -hmm. want to make sure that our audience and our community is feeling that fire in them to show up to the polls. Um, so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, what is the importance of young people in these spaces and why we shouldn't feel sort of like overwhelmed by the feeling of mm -hmm. um, the system and the structure that often feels very like confusing to engage with. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think lots of times people have said to me, and I remember feeling this way as well, that how does my voice count? Well, your voice counts a great deal. And as for me, evidence of that is how every leader wants to have a youth advisory panel or have youth supporting them, whether it's through their social media platforms or through, as the prime minister has, um, an advisory panel. And that is because every every decision we are making impacts generations to come. And uh, oftentimes the legislation we're passing today, we won't, won't see the real impact of it for several years on. And so it's vitally important that young people are engaged in the process, advising, challenging, mm -hmm. um, correct, helping correct when we get off offside on some of these issues. And so for me, it's vitally important that young people are engaging because, um, and we, uh, for all kinds of reasons, but most importantly, it's going to impact your lives. And right now, I'm painfully aware that although everybody says we're concerned about environmental and climate issues, it hasn't taken the priority it needs to. And it hasn't taken a priority in, in ways that would be sustainable for the next, uh, well, not just the next generation, but generations to come. And I often find myself guided by what elders have taught me over the years, which is to to always work thinking of the past seven generations and planning for the next seven generations. And if we're doing that, then we should be focusing on sustainable development. We should be focusing on the very issues that matter to people, including what we've seen during this pandemic, which is um, that those who are most marginalized, whether it's by age, older and younger, by health, um, those who are in margin more marginal situations, um, and income and race are vitally uh, are are more likely to suffer the worst impacts of you know inadequate policy, inadequate legislation, and and we also know that the younger someone gets involved in political issues, the more likely that engagement is to be sustained. And so, I think it is. I agree with you. I think we should be doing more in school uh, to encourage young people to engage. My kids grew up here in Ottawa because I had moved here when my son, who's now almost 31, was a baby. 
And I think the engagement was slightly different just because we were here in the capital, but it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be an accident of where you happen to be and who your teachers are, whether you, you learn about these issues, it should be built into the cur curriculum. Absolutely. And I think, um, I think also uh, what really throws me off a little bit, like I consider myself like an informed individual. I pay attention. I'm not an expert, but I pay enough attention to what's going on. And I still feel like there's such giant gaps in my understanding. And no matter what research I do into areas, um, I just can't seem to find it because I feel like maybe it's reflective of, you know, the fact that our systems are colonial um, or of the fact that democracy is something um, that, you know, now everyone has the right to vote, but it wasn't an equal or equitable access experience at the beginning. So um, supporting everybody to engage in it was never really part of the, like, the purpose of it. Um, but I guess, like, yeah, like, I still feel really confused. And I keep trying to remind myself that that's not on me. The fact that I'm paying attention and engaging is like the most important first step and that um, being open to learn is really all we can do uh, in order to engage because the opposite is like ignoring the issues and that doesn't change anything. No. And, you know, it's not lost on me that, we, you know, we're t we were just talking about some of the issues for in Indigenous and other racialized people in Canada. Well, you know, the first Indigenous senator was an Indigenous senator passing laws, making laws in Canada, but didn't yet have the right to vote. Like, think about that for a minute. How ridiculous is that in a country like ours that before Indigenous people had, the First Nations people had the right to vote, uh, we had an Indigenous senator. But so, you know, we, we need to be clear about our colonial history. Yesterday was Emancipation Day, and I was shocked by how many people engaged with some of the social, you know, I, I put out a little bit of social media about the history of slavery in Canada. And I had people who I've known for many years say, you know, we didn't have slavery, did we? We were, you know, we were where the end of the ra Underground Railroad was. And I'm, you know, thinking, wow, you know, okay, we need a lot more education on a number of issues. And so you're right. And it's not on you. It should be something that we are owning, not to get mired in the past, but owning so we can move forward in a, in a more equitable, just and fair way. Because if we don't own that past, we are likely to continue it. And can, if not continue in the same ways, certainly continue on. And I often tell when, you know, I, I um, teach law students, I often say, you know, you go to law school in part because we have made our laws inaccessible and that's not okay. Uh, we expect, you know, people to know what the laws are. There's an old adage that often, you know, um, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, you know, maybe it should be <laughs> when you don't know what the law is that's governing you, um, how can you be expected to follow it? And so, so we, I think we have a responsibility to make the process more open, um, to to ensure that we actually do engage with folks. And so, I keep repeating myself, but that's why I'm, you know, really honored that you have been, you know, that you're engaging with me in this way. Oh my gosh, we're honored to have you. It's such a big deal. Our our group chat was popping off when we when we shared that we'd be having Senator Kim on it with us. They were so excited. Oh. Well, I, we should all be engaging. Like, if there's any senators who are saying no, we should be asking why. They're, we're public servants. You know, we, we are in service of you, not vice versa. So, yeah, I think that's an excellent sort of area that um, I would love to touch on. So, I think what often, what I've been like sort of explaining to our team or taught, like, because we've got a fairly large team, so we talk about these things quite a bit. And it's kind of like um, elected official. Well, I know you're you're a politician, but you're not elected. You're appointed. But when we think, talk about our MPs and our MPPs, um, you know these these leaders are elected to represent us and work for us. But somehow the power has shifted so that they hold it and we don't. Mm -hmm. And part of that is that like millennials and Gen Z haven't been engaging traditionally at the same rate that Gen X and boomers do. So it's like you have four bosses, but two of them are checking on in on you on a regular basis and two kind of like come in and out as needed. So like the people you're more accountable to end up being the, the bosses who are checking in more. But what like 
how do we adjust that power dis- like imbalance? Because I feel like around election period, we hear a lot of things around, you know, I work for you and I'm going to represent you. And then they get into these roles and then you email them being like, these are the issues we care about and they do whatever they want anyways. So mm-hmm. it sort of feels like if you really represent us, then don't we hold the power? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that is true. Um, the, one of the realities is, though, as we're hearing right now, is um, parties are getting ready for the, you know, non-secret, you know, of, about to be called election, whenever that is. Rumors now that because we may be headed into a fourth wave, they may put it off, but who knows? And and the reality is that it's the people who have resources and fuel those parties that often are privileged in terms of who gets access to the people in power, who has access to um, to influence those who are making decisions. And that shouldn't be the way it is. It you know it is how it has operated. It's also true that when people are running for office, they say all kinds of things. And I, you know, I, I've said it in um, in other social media that I actually believe many of them believe what they're saying. It's not that I don't think they actively go and lie. If they do, then that's a whole nother issue that we need to address. But I do think many of them do intend to fulfill the promises, but they get into politics and then they have to figure out, okay, what do you, what do you, um, you know, give room on so that you can get some of what you want. And, you know, one of the two of my least favorite sayings that I've learned since I came to the Senate was sometimes you have to put a bit of water in your wine. And I'm thinking like, what does that mean? And it means basically people are saying, you know, you have to, um, you know, give away some of what you had in, you know, had planned to do here in order to get the greater, you know, move forward and for greater good. And the other, and this one I just detest is, um, perfect is the enemy of good. And and so, you know, and this has come up several times when we've been dealing with legislation where if it's an area that I know something about, I would say, let's make this better. Let's not just leave mediocre legislation. Let's make it better. So whether it was segregation or sexual assault law, those are two that uh, immigration law that I was fighting uh, to, you know, to improve the legislation. And politics comes in and people say, well, if you're going to insist on that, we're going to stall the legislation and nothing will get through. And so I get even people who are allies pushing to say, oh, don't push on that, Kim, because now's not the right time. Or as in the segregation piece, you know, some of the government folks saying, you know, if if you actually push on this, then there'll be no law applying to this area because Um, parliament, in that case, parliament had risen and it was just before the last election. And they said, and the blood will be on your hands. And my response was, that's nonsense. If this law doesn't pass, the current law stays in effect. And in fact, it's great that there was more accountability. And yet two thirds of my colleagues bought that argument and voted with the government and rejected the amendments the Senate had made to segregation law that would have actually not only caused segregation to be, you know, the argument was it was being eliminated, it was actually being renamed, but we were putting in place accountability measures, which would have meant at the very least, we would have had better detection or better monitoring and reporting and accountability of corrections that didn't pass. And if you've any of your um, colleagues and followers have been following that whole area, exactly what we predicted would happen, happened a whole bunch. And then the pandemic happened and a whole bunch of people got put in segregation with no accountability. So it's, it is a huge issue of how do we hold accountable? You know, when I'm saying the very things that I hold dear, sometimes I have given way on. So um, I have, I have never voted to put in place something I disagreed with. I have voted against it. But I have sometimes abstained because I think the principle is important, but I actually don't agree with where the government's going. And I think rightfully people should be holding me to account on that. And, and you know, some people did. So, for instance, on the um, the assisted dying bill, I, refu- I abstained on that vote. Why? Because... Um, Do I think people should have the right to decide if they want to have medical assistance in dying? Yes. 
but do I think we disproportionately put people at a disadvantage if we don't first provide all the services to allow them to live? Yes. And do I think the way to do this is to put in criminal law to criminalize people who make assisted dying possible as a way to limit the scope of it? No, I think that, you know, the criminal law has a role to say, this is what we accept as okay in our society. Um, but it doesn't mean we should just criminalize people if they if they do things that they're trying to flex in, with good intention to try and meet the needs of folks. And so so that was a really good hard example of, you know, the for some people, the lines were really clear. For me, the lines were incredibly blurred and um, no doubt partly because during this pandemic, we've seen just how many people who were in horrible conditions, living conditions in long-term care, whether it was because they were elderly or had disabilities um, or were working in those conditions and then having to live in homeless shelters because they didn't weren't paid sufficiently. We, the gaps and the huge problems in our system of inequality were exposed. And so it didn't, it wasn't a clear path. It wasn't a clear path of saying, yes, people should have the right to choose. Of course they should. But if your range of options of choices is so circumscribed that it's like an unlivable situation or death, then I don't think those are real choices. And, you know, I'm, I think we have an obligation as, as people in our positions to keep pointing that out. And so it's also why I keep speaking against, um, some of the financial decisions the government has made, particularly not to assist the millions of people still living in abject poverty or living below the poverty line or can't afford housing. People, you know, the folks with living in communities where there are boil water advisories, people living who can't afford food, those are all part of our responsibility. And I think young people understand that and are articulating it in ways that too many of us in the political scene have just sort of glossed over. I hope I'm not one of those, but I, I, because I'm part of this institution, I have to take that responsibility too. Yeah, I think, I think that like so much of what you touched on is part of, part of the fatigue in engaging with politics. It's, I don't know. I don't think it's apathy necessarily. Like I don't care. It's like, what's the point if they're, if it doesn't work the way that they promised it would. Because what we were taught about democracy in that brief little period of time was, you know, that it was a space where you could challenge ideas, where where um, everyone has a voice, where the concerns will be heard, that the best decisions for everybody is made. And often it feels like the best decisions, you know, um, we're seeing in some provinces that uh, decisions to keep big box stores open were due to lobbyists, not not because it was the best decision for the public and like so you're seeing the influence of the private sector and money in mm -hmm. some decision making where like that's not what you taught us in school like we weren't no one told us that we would be going up against like large corporate groups and interests and that at some points those would be prioritized over the people um and I think that's what makes it really like uh, daunting or overwhelming is is the fact that well, how come you don't see individual MPs or MPPs or um, I know it's different in other provinces that's not uh, MPPs but vote against their party leader like why is it that everyone votes together every single time why why don't you see the unique perspective that your local MP has um why don't you hear that on the floor? Why don't you hear those like that, that like, it just feels very outdated. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. the system as it exists right now makes sense for the world that we currently live in. And it just makes it really gross to like watch. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting that, you know, the, in some, some parts of the world, I think some of the most progressive ideas are coming from uh, countries where, women and in particular racialized women are leading and also where you don't have just you know two or three major political parties where you have to work in coalition and and you're more likely to i think work for the public good than vote you know do something that will get the party ahead with you know whoever it is the corporate interests or whoever and so i do see i do really think that the work that young people are doing to raise attention 
you know, has made a huge impact. Just look at the difference in who's now being represented in media, in, you know, on whether it's social media, you know, more popular media. The, the fact that we have to address issues of young people, of environment, of racialized people, and we're not there so much on, you know, economic inequality yet, I don't think, but even that people are picking up on that it's not okay to, to be relying on the people who make the least and, and not figuring out that we actually need to provide housing and adequate income. And, and so, you know, it's during this time that we've seen the rise of interest in basic income, for instance, and guaranteed livable income and free post-secondary education and the opportunity for people who otherwise wouldn't have the options to to be able to get education, to be able to stay home for their own safety, whether it's, you know, now during a pandemic for health reasons, or because they want to care for somebody who they can't afford to. So we've got a move in childcare that's, an, you know, a nod in that direction, but we haven't gone to the next step of saying, you know, we need to provide the, the resources. And I actually think, you know, it's initiatives like yours and all of the amazing young people working with on Canada who are making, are, are pushing um, people to take notice. And, and I think uh, you, we can and are seeing, we are seeing a difference. And I think we can see even greater difference by the type of engagement that you're, you're pushing for. So I hope people don't feel hopeless. Um, I often say when I've been really frustrated with things, I sometimes vibrate between rage and despair. And I try and, you know, fuel that to get to the place of action because, you know, you can get immobilized by fear, by despair. Rage probably doesn't immobilize you, probably doesn't move you in the right, you know, in the, in the I shouldn't say the right, but the most uh, productive direction sometimes. But, you know, it is the anger of what is not right with the world right now that I hope fuels all of us, um, but particularly young people to to push us and push us hard. And, and, you know, and what I saw on the Hill two days ago was emblematic of that. It was a lot of young people saying, you know, this is not a place for politicians. This is a place where we have want to ensure we have a future. And it was indigenous, non-indigenous. Um, and, you know, it was a whole array, but it was people who were really concerned that what's been happening, particularly for in this case, in that case for indigenous people is not okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, that, to be honest, like I'm, I'm asking all these questions about how to deal with this, like overwhelming feeling, um, because I know that something people are, people come up against, but I've never felt as hopeful for a future as I do now. Um, I am so inspired by the people on our project, but also just like the people engaging in our comments, the people DMing us, the people sharing our stuff. Um, and other like initiatives that are like young adult led in our country that, you know, you're seeing people speak up, you're seeing that um, may, like maybe our systems have not, are not changing as fast as we want them to. And that is a huge issue, but the opinion of young people and our collective awareness around issues has, mm -hmm. and now we have to transition that collective awareness into collective action. And the best way to show up and like indicate where we stand on these issues is to vote. Um, and with this upcoming election, there is power in, you know, the fact that there's the 40% of the voters eligible for the upcoming election are millennials and Gen Z, all of which over, like overall, it's a much more left-leaning set of gener generations that want to see change for the climate, that want to see human rights value, that want to see um, income inequity uh, addressed to, to, to find policies that support communities that are vulnerable or oppressed. Like it's inspiring to see that coming up. And the only way to build on this momentum and our collective awareness is to show up to the polls. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really hoping that the series that you and I are doing together will remind people of that importance, um, and engage with us with questions and anything that you may need. Cause we read it. We, we hear you, we use that to, you know, create the next post to create the next video. So, um, yeah, is, uh, I, before we round up this topic, uh, is there anything else you want to add around? youth engagement 
No, I think it's fantastic. And as you pointed out, I mean, Basic Income for Youth um, have done this amazing recent series. You may have seen it on What Basic Income Bought Me. And, you know, I, I have seen more people engage through that Ser those series of messages than all the, you know, I've done an annotated bibliography and we've got, you know, a perspectives document, but that's capturing people's attention. Like, okay, I was able to, you know, I'm able to get a new bed. I was able to feed, you know, buy my kid cashews for the first time because they love cashews. I was able to put groceries in the fridge. You know, I'm, you've seen them. So I'm, but you know, that to me was a really good example of an effective way to engage with people and have them understand an issue that many people are saying, oh, it's just about giving money to rich people. And, and the reality is nobody credible is arguing for a demigrant type of model where money goes to everybody. People are talking about what we learned through CERB was that if you actually provide resources to people when they need it, it can help. And yet, even during this pandemic, we've left behind, depending on what numbers you look at, three and a half to five million people. And that's not okay. And and young people are telling us that. Yeah. So I, yeah, get out and vote. <laughs> get out and vote, guys, please. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today, Senator Kim. And um, to everybody else, tune in next week for episode two of this.